yeah so welcome to the gathering of uh, critical care physicians so the first the second talk now given by dr rashika chakravarti who is a nephrologist clinical nephrologist and uh, researcher in, and is a mentor to the young nephrologists who are passing out for the last 10 years then come there and uh, clinician and nephrologist par excellence to give his talk on the clinical pearls in ak and what is the new concepts in ak so uh, ak has evolved for the last 15 years before it was called arf now we have a definition standard management how to treat which patients how to stage the patients and how to prognosticate the patients and lot of clinical trials going on in the field of ak majority of them are in the supportive care rather than as a treatment part of ak so any new things now will dr rashik chakravarti will focus and highlight on that good morning friends thank you nageshwar and sheshi dr venkat asked me to one convey something very very relevant in the clinical aspect of aki at the same time what has happened new and over the last 50 years or so there has been a evolving understanding of acute kidney injury as a syndrome so many times we think aki is a diagnosis whereas i want to emphasize it is a syndrome for you to treat you will have to know lot more about the particular patient and why the patient has aki rather than simply put on paper acute kidney injury let me take you back to 2000 or so arguments in various hospitals multi specialties were just coming in late 1990s the first corporate hospital in the country was in 1983 many of you may be aware the argument was who are the smartest doctors in the hospital now intensivists were not there that time most icus were managed by mbbs people intensive care has grown only in the last 10 years so obviously cardiologists and nephrologists were the people where the contest was acute mi the mortality reduced from 1950s to 2000 from 60% to 6% acute kidney injury severe the mortality was 50% in 1950 it was also 50% in 2000 so you don't need to go into other details to know who is more smart obviously cardiologists are more smart they have patients who come to them with symptoms they have a sign they have one test tropi today it used to be ckmb those days and they can do a intervention patient goes home walking 1950 i'm just quoting homer smith no constant pathological picture has been observed nor is it expected in a variety of circumstances where uncomplicated renal ischemia renal edema cas toxins contribute to various elements of renal debacle so what you and i see as aki in our icu could be because of 10 different things or a combination of these things so if you look at the journey of aki as a understanding this is a paper by Ronco in 2016. He tra put in place what happened 50 years ago and in the 1990s, late 1990s, even in 2000. In fact, the first diagnosis of AKI with the present criteria came after 2006. That means not even 10 years ago. There was published 35 definitions for acute kidney injury. These were all accepted. There were published 35 definitions and this was a AJKD in 2004. 2005 ADKI meeting brought out, you cannot go on like this unless you have a uniformity of diagnosis. Then your rifle, then akin, then KD go came. And today we have what we believe is a huge improvement in the last 50 years. You look at the serum creatinine or GFR, you look at the urine output criteria you club them together and call AKI stage 1, 2, 3. Now we know this is not enough because your outcomes of AKI have not changed that much. 
you are able to pick it up a little early but your outcomes are not great so people are talking of adding or superimposing over this understanding what we now call as biomarkers which will be able to pick up AKI extremely early when there is just functional drop or damage to the tubule and then what we are now diagnosis after GFR has dropped we should be able to diagnose earlier what is called as on your left extreme serum creatinine blind range. So most of the times by the time you and I make a diagnosis of AKI several probably 72 to 96 hours have passed and you have missed that serum creatinine blind range. So your patients today are this complex, they are on dialysis, they are on a filter for sepsis, they are on ECMO, this is one of our patients who came to, with, came to us with toxic inhalation in a factory, young male 32 years. He was on CRRT for 14 days, he was on a sepsis filter, he was on ECMO but after 14 days walked home. So what happens to these people once they go home? That is also a area of interest today for nephrologists and intensivists. There is some data coming up, those who are treated with CAPD, that is peritoneal dialysis for AKI, recover their renal functions faster. I am just stimulating you with that statement. Though most of us are not doing it, this is one of our patients post CABG AKI purely managed on peritoneal dialysis. So the so called KDGO criteria which you and I use today using serum creatinine, using urine output has lot of fallacies. Once you know there is a problem, probably we will improve upon that. As you know, serum creatinine and GFR, if my GFR is 140, at 130, 120, 100, 90, my serum creatinine does not change. So somebody gets into the ICU, the serum creatinine is 0.8, does not mean the GFR has not changed. It is possible the GFR is changing and it may change by 40 ml or 50 ml before you see the serum creatinine going up. There are other problems with creatinine because the generation rate in the ICU is different. You have a volume of distribution. You have somebody who has extra volume, his creatinine is diluted. So you have to have a correction factor for the volume overload of your patients. And there are other things like other drugs interfering. So keeping all this in mind, after the rifle or akin came in, several people across the world, this almost 14 different studies validated using creatinine and urine output to diagnose AKI. And other important thing that came out to our understanding is irrespective of the reason why a patient comes into the hospital. He might have come for an orthopedic surgery, he might have come for an obstetric reason, but if AKI sets in, the outcomes of that admission depend on AKI, not the primary diagnosis. So AKI becomes so important for you and me and all again reiterating 50 years no change in the outcomes. Once you have severe AKI, your mortality is high and more importantly we realized soft indications which we should have picked up bedside earlier which we are missing are extremely important. Why was urine output included in the criteria for AKI when urine output can be subjected to so many variations? So the data came from studies which said episodes of oliguria, duration of oliguria both had major bearing on the outcomes of AKI. Mortality and morbidity depend on simple things like episodes of oliguria and the duration of oliguria. So when you combine both your survivors and non-survivors, they do follow the stage of AKI by what we do use now like KDGO, both creatinine and urine output criteria. But as I said, our understanding today is better. We are diagnosing people quite late when the GFR has dropped and the creatinine has gone up. The concept or the clinical pearl we all learn now, try to look at patients earlier. Look at them when they are at risk, not when they have developed a problem. The concept of renal functional reserve is now very robust and something that you and I, if we are spending time in the ICUs, should know. What the renal functional reserve tells us is, just like heart rate increases when you have a exercise, your kidney GFR increases when there is a stress. This is physiological stress 
or pathological stress. There is va arteriolar vasodilatation, decreased vascular resistance, increased renal blood flow which improves your GFR. So patients come to you with intact renal functional reserve. They go through a admission for whatever reason and what you and I do to that patient leaves that patient with less RFR. So though on paper it looks like the patient came with one creatinine, went home with one creatinine, we would have knocked off around 40 ml of that reserve GFR that the patient has. So there is data now coming up which is a concept well accepted in each different individual. If they have established CKD, their renal functional reserve is zero. That is the reason they are more prone for an acute insult. So when a patient comes under you, he will come, this is data from Dr. Kellum's unit who post CABG. If they had no AKI, at the end of six months, what was the incidence of MAKE? Just like MACE now, we have major adverse kidney events. If there was no AKI during the CABG, at six months, the incidence of MAKE was 4%. If they had just oliguria as a criteria and no other creatinine was normal, at six months, they had 7.6% of MAKE. If they had simple rise in creatinine, no drop in urine output, only one criteria met, at six months, 13.5% had MAKE. If both urine output criteria and creatinine criteria were met, they had close to 22% MAKE at six months. What does this tell you? When a patient comes under your care, you should look at it patient as is the patient at risk of AKI or not at risk of AKI. Then try to see, we very early pick up by whatever criteria that you want to use. You can't wait till the creatinine goes up. As you know, 0.3 rise in creatinine is associated with increased mortality, increased morbidity and majority of these patients don't recover fully. Once they have an episode, they will go on to CKD spectrum. So if you look at patients with renal functional reserve, take them for a surgery, patients with preoperative renal functional reserve of 15 ml, I showed you data on up to 40 to 50 ml RFR in normal individuals. Those who have less than 15 ml, they are 12 times more likely to develop a significant AKI post procedure. This is when you know the insult exactly like a surgery or a contrast exposure. So one of the things Venkat asks us in ICU, nephrologist Pilustama Mirochi MP Kutar sir, Amy Jailiru. Most of the times the so the answer for that in literature is AKI can be AKI, which you and I pick up, clinical AKI, which you and I may miss, subclinical AKI, which we always miss. If you get a nephrologist early into the ICU and one of the pearls you carry home today is call the nephrologist early, he may pick up the subclinical AKI and may avoid further insult from happening to the patients. This is six different studies done in different time, time frames, randomized studies which said please call your nephrologist early into the ICU. So moving on to we understood the problem and good thing about creatinine, urine output and we also understood the concept of renal functional reserve. So people now recommend that you should get a patient at risk, know what is the renal functional reserve before insulting the patient's kidney. So that tells us most of us are getting into treating AKI without knowing much about it. Look at this gentleman and I like this cartoon so much. Balaji weds Rajalakshmi or Pavitra. He is not sure whom he is going to marry. Most of us were not sure about marriage but we knew whom we are going to marry. This is one step ahead and I think the predicament of intensivists and nephrologists when they at least tackle AKI is something like this. It is not true only about us across the world. Two meetings I was part of 2019-2020. This is uh, KDGO nomenclature on kidney function and disease and uh, you see the faculty. Most of the experts have less hair on their heads. That is one of the criteria for becoming an expert. And the second meeting was controversies in acute kidney injury. So they concluded, we were almost 35 of us from across the world. The conclusion was 
you can you agree on certain things like risk assessment diagnosis fluid management hemodynamic management drug stewardship and rrt but there was a large area where there was evidence but we lacked consensus there was a list of them that we could give and they also enumerated topics for future research i'll not be able to spend time on it we'll move on to a case 38 year old male farmer by occupation went to a hospital in guntur and progressively getting worse over a period of time he was tachypneic tachycardic hypoxemic 1.7 creatinine lot of things happened there and patient became more and more sick was shifted to hyderabad when he came to hyderabad he had a creatinine of 4.2 from 1.7 two days ago so rapidly progressing renal failure potassium of 4.9 severe metabolic acidosis serum albumin was 2.2 the entire history is around 2 to 3 months progressively not not feeling well some fluid overload so we had to dialyze him lot of things happened the diagnosis was aki akin 3 multifactorial we thought of contrast because he had a ct scan diuretics and significant right heart failure isolated right heart failure and shock which we labeled as cardiogenic shock pulmonary hypertension significant lot of things were done then finally patient went on hdf didn't tolerate went on crrt started improving as we removed his volume totally some 10 liters of volume was removed patient became very well and then he could be discharged by the time we started planning discharge he started having his platelets dropping 80000 then 70000 then 40000 at this time we agreed to send ana anti ds dna and strongly positive ana anti smith and anti ds dna so this was systemic lupus erythematosus presenting over 3 months then coming with rprf we didn't even biopsy with steroids and mycophenolate presently he comes every few months once with near normal renal functions the reason i put up this patient is one autoimmune disease masquerading as heart failure could be isolated like right heart or whatever pulmonary hypertension then presenting as ongoing for months together fluid overload some protein loss is not uncommon unless we think of it we will miss it the second important thing was the minute we decongested him of 10 liters he started pouring out urine so please know this concept you don't need any other reason for aki if you have a fluid overload patient when you cause fluid overload your venous congestion increases your intratubular pressure goes up and this cartoon talks of in the tubule when the pressure increases your gfr falls because of just increased pressure in the tubule so a fluid overload patient who has abdominal hypertension intra abdominal hypertension intra tubular hypertension can have aki and have rprf go on dialysis just because of fluid overload telling you you should be extremely careful and people actually did you have a, a filtration fraction of 14 when you have a fluid overload patient the filtration fraction can fall to 4 mm so avoid fluid overload and know this if you are giving 1 liter of saline to your patient in the icu 1 liter of normal saline it is like you giving the patient 20 chips packet of lace and making him eat in 24 hours no different the same amount of salt you are giving to your patient so giving salt or saline just like that is going to have very very poor outcomes next case i want to talk of whenever you see aki have a very low threshold if you don't understand it biopsy the patient even in the icu as long as there is no contraindication this is a paper from vikers unit vikers is from harvard who tried to put saying objectively when should you biopsy an aki as a clinician we hesitate to biopsy sick patients but let me tell you this a 38 year old lady went to a hospital in tolichoki some vague discomfort they found 3.67 but they found bilateral bulky kidneys the ref, the uh, urologist put two stents 
saying acute pyelonephritis. Patient came to us after 4 days, 7.2 creatinine, dialyzed, we biopsied, biopsy showed 100% crescents. Crescentric glomerulonephritis presenting as vague symptoms and creatinine going up. So this patient of course did extremely well because we treated on time and even now our baseline creatinine is 1.7. So whenever the patient has an unexplained AKI, don't wait too long, please biopsy. When you look at diagnostic workup, there are so many things which we have moved away, but literature does give us importance of simple urine examinations, what we call as parazella scoring. In the urine, you do a parazella scoring, you have a clue whether this is simple ATN or AAN or AGN and then you can address. I had uh, uh, around 100 patients of AKI in Ashoda High Tech, how they presented and they think we will skip that. Multifactorial were 17 out of 100, single predominant factor around 83 and drugs were not uncommon, drug induced was not uncommon. 25 of them had dialysis with good outcomes. But the reason I wanted to present this data is the concept that you and I should walk away from this hall, every AKI contributes to CKD in the community. Most of your AKI does not recover. They have an apparent recovery, but they do go on to, and the severity of AKI, duration of AKI, fluid overload during that admission contribute to chronicity in these patients and they get more a CKD and then more AKI in future. This is known as a step ladder pattern of progression. Most of the CKD in India now if you see 30% of it is supposed to be contributed by AKI which was not followed up regularly. So the present concept AKI is around 7 days. The minute you cross 7 days you label them as AKD. Even if you discharge them, acute kidney disease, you ask them to follow up. And even in this cohort of patients, there is reason to control the protein loss, control the hypertension and salt uh, intake to be reduced. So the present nomenclature for those of us who have to see these patients, AKI less than 7 days, AKD less than 3 months, CKD more than 3 months and this is a continuing spectrum one contributing to the other. CKD has more AKI which progresses towards ESRD. So this is C -regist CRRT registry, Southeast Asia, India has one center from our group and if you look at that data, this is only Thailand uh, data they looked at. Those of them who had a one episode of AKI got discharged. When they looked at it, the make was 41 percent. We saw is the developed world. I think there is a lot of need for us to improve our AKI care in our ICUs and moving on to RRT for AKI. Under different headings, we talk about it, timing, access, modality, dose, anticoagulation and weaning. We will not have time to go through all that, but what we did was Tell the world, AKI in the developing world is different, it is not the same and we hosted in Hyderabad one ad key having around 30 experts from across the world and 6 papers came out of it, AKI in the developing world. So anyone of you who is going to practice in India or developing world, please go through these 6 papers, detection and management of AKI, AKI risk assessment, prevention, renal support. Uh, recognition in low and middle con uh, income countries and strategies for rehabilitation. Among them, renal support for AKI in the developing world is one of the most downloaded articles in the Kidney International. And one of the concepts that we brought out was when you look at a patient with needing RRT, we spend time on diagnosis, concepts of RFR, then different presentations. Now. When you see patient for RRT, always look at that patient individually. Is there capacity in that kidney for the next 24 hours or 48 hours to take care of all the metabolic needs, transfusions you are giving, the nutrition you are giving. So the demand on the patient versus the capacity of that kidney, otherwise better to plan for earlier dialysis so that you do not allow fluid overload, you do not allow acidosis to adversely outcome. Uh, adversely affect the outcome which means more CKD in the population. So answers that you and I need to get, where sh when should I uh, initiate RRT, 
most appropriate look at demand capacity paradigm when should you transition from one modality to another like crrt to sled and when should you liberate the patients from rrt all these has now some amount of data supporting each uh, category there is some consensus which i shared with you this is an article we wrote for seminars in dialysis crrt in the developing world talking only about what a developing world clinician faces when they have to offer crrt for their patients many many years ago this cartoon is from emil paganini i don't know how many have heard that name he did human work in aki in the icus he was from cleveland ohio where he actually categorized what was available this was published in 1996 now we have actually moved away from a particular thing for all patients for to what is called as precision rrt you see a patient you look at the demand paradigm uh, demand capacity paradigm and then look at what is needed for that patient on that day this was again a ad key consensus meeting in asiago which talked of this is kellam and ronco you can see big names in uh, aki what we came out with was this is uh, those who had solute as the uh, modality for clearance so you always start off with a default prescription if you are running a unit you have to have a default prescription next day morning rounds you see look at the patient more closely the patient's need may be that your clearance has to go up on the rrt in another patient the metabolism was better your output is better you have to change the default prescription to fit the patient's need on that particular day you cannot keep one modality of rrt or one prescription of rrt for all the seven days that the patient goes this is now called as crrt or rrt precision delivery this is the current concept your patient has to be looked at every day and you have to change the prescription of rrt finally for you and me very important drug induced aki that itself will be a topic for one day's discussion i'm just trying to introduce it please note any patient you see with aki consider this as a possibility so this was direct study which recruited patients across 20 centers in the world india contributed the maximum number of drug induced renal injury patients to this study so with that let me stop take home pearls on aki please know every patient you come across could be at risk of aki stop looking at aki as a diagnosis after 7 days look at every patient there are two things available one is called as renal angina index the other one is called as malhotra score when a patient gets into icu apply these things on your patient in your case sheet boldly put at risk of aki or not if the patient is at risk of aki the type of fluid you give the volume of fluid you give the drugs you give the dose of the drugs you give everything will be little different and the minute you see start seeing patients in that way your outcomes are significantly better you have to diagnose earlier and that happens when you have them at risk autoimmune don't think that it doesn't exist in india in fact our autoimmune incidence and prevalence is much higher than in the west which we missed for many many decades biopsy if you are not able to find out the cause have a low threshold if there is no contraindication don't hesitate to biopsy we have any number of patients where biopsy change the management simple things like crescentric gn interstitial nephritis glomerular nephritis all your medications please review them on a daily basis visa vis the background of aki fluid overload is the worst thing that you can do your patients they will stay in the icu longer they will go on ventilator longer they will die more often even if they get discharged they will come back to hospital more often with one episode of aki and fluid overload one major thing that you and i can do differently cumulative balance on every day case sheet so patient gets on monday you are seeing the patient on thursday you should know how much volume has gone into the patient from the minute the patient came into hospital till the minute that you are seeing the patient the old intake output charts daily won't work you have to have intake output chart daily plus cumulative balance the minute your cumulative balance has crossed 5% more than the patient's weight so if somebody is 60 kgs 
you have already made the patient 3 kgs positive, your outcomes are not going to be good. The minute you start 10% overload from basic body weight, they will die more often and they have more morbidity. So fluid overload is the worst thing that you and I can do for our patients. When you look at RRT, always consider demand capacity paradigm. Please don't wait for creatinine to reach 6 or potassium to reach 6. And think of precision RRT like changing the prescription on a daily basis. Concept of RFR is very strong now. I think standard of care in future will be when people are going for a procedure, you know their baseline RFRs, so therefore you know whether you can do this much of contrast or not or this drug can be given or not. And the most important which I would not have given data on is follow up. You discharge a patient of follow up, please do not think patient is fine and forget about the patient. Just like anybody else, you discharge a patient of acute MI, you are asking them to come back for follow up. Similarly, AKA patients will come for follow up, they have to be followed and seen, they will have new onset protein loss. You have to control that, you have to reduce salt, you may want to keep their target blood pressures, target sugars, avoid certain drugs, but all of them are going to be part of your protocol to prevent AKI from moving to AKD to CK. Thank you very much.